All right, this is our units three and four diagnostic, uh, all the problems done out. Okay, so here we go. We have number one, we have three i times i to the seventh minus one plus i squared times one minus i to the tenth. So first things first, I would distribute the three i to the first set of parentheses and the i squared to the second. So we would get three i to the eighth minus three i plus i squared minus i to the twelfth. Now, um, i... I is the number that we multiply it by itself to get negative 1. That was really the definition. And so we said I was the square root of negative 1. Using this concept, I cubed is I squared times I by properties of exponents. And I squared is negative 1, so I cubed is negative I. And I to the fourth is I squared times I squared, which is negative 1 times negative 1, which is 1. And this will, this will repeat in a cycle. So we can actually use that cycle to our advantage. So 3i to the 8th, i to the 8th is i to the 4th times itself. So that's, that's just 1. 3i is good. i squared is negative 1. And i to the 12th is i to the 4th raised to the 3rd. In other words, it's 3i to the 4th multiplied together, and that is also 1. So now we get 3 minus 3i minus 1 minus 1. So that comes out to 1 minus 3i, which is the answer. OK. These are a little bit more difficult. You have negative exponents. So I have i to the negative fifth divided by uh, plus 4i to the negative seventh minus i to the negative eleventh times 1 minus i. So first thing we can do is distribute here. So we get this. Now we have to figure out what all these negative exponents are. So a few ways to do this. So if you remember, one, our, our motivating definition for i, since negative 1 rotates 180 degrees clockwise, that's i squared, and i rotates 90 degrees counterclockwise from our initial starting point, which is 1, 0, or 1. Okay, so i to the third is here, and i to the fourth is there. But if I want to start, if I want to go in the negative direction, meaning I want to, I can rotate clock, clockwise, and this would be i to the negative first. Sort of similar to now that we have, you know, this would be like a negative 90 degree rotation. So if I think about that, i to the negative fifth is going around 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 90 degree rotations counterclockwise, and you end up at negative i. Another way to handle i to the negative fifth is to look at this as 1 over i to the fifth and multiply top and bottom by something that will give you 1 or negative 1. So, for example, I'll multiply by i to the third because i to the fifth times i to the third is i to the eighth. And I have i to the third on the top now. i to the eighth is 1 and i to the third is negative i. So you can get it that way as well. It seemed like when we did these, a lot of people liked the visual as opposed to the algebraic way, but both of them work. Um, so similarly, i to the negative seventh is seven 90 degree turns clockwise. So that would give us four i. i to the 11th would be another eight, nine, 10, 11 turns, 90 degree turns counterclockwise. So you end up at i again. And i to the negative 10th, you just go back one. So you end up at i squared, which is negative one. So we get Negative i plus 4i minus i, which is 2i, plus negative 1. So if you're putting this in a plus bi form, you would write negative 1 plus 2i. Final answer. Okay. Number three, we're really being asked here to rationalize the denominator. We learned earlier in the year that I can multiply top and bottom of the fraction by the conjugate, 4 minus 2i. And that will actually rationalize the denominator. So let's do that. I get 30 times 4, which is 120. 30 times negative 2i, which is negative 60i. 10i times 4, which is positive 40i. And negative 10i, oh, sorry, positive 10i times 2i, which is negative 20i squared over. So I get 4 times 4, which is 16. 4 times negative 2i, which is negative 8i. 2i times 4, which is positive 8i, which is actually the goal. You want to get those middle terms to cancel. And positive 2i times negative 2i is negative 4i squared. 
all right, now we have to clean this up. So let's look at the top here. So I get negative 20i squared is really negative 20 times negative 1, which is positive 20. So I have 120 plus 20, which is 140. And then I have negative 60 plus 40i, which is negative 20i, over the 8i's and the positive and 8i, sorry, positive and negative 8i cancel, and I get 16 minus 4i squared, and again, i squared is negative 1, so I get plus 4, so 16 plus 4 is 20, so I get 140 minus 20i over 20, and I can do this several ways. I could factor out a 20 from the numerator, and I would be left with 7 minus uh, i over 20, and cancel that out, and get 7 minus i. You could also do that by splitting this up into two fractions, 140 over 20 minus 20i over 20, and you would get the same answer, 7 minus i. All right, good stuff. So we're solving in number four. We're solving each equa this equation in simplest a plus bi form. So I would just use the quadratic formula, but you could also complete the square here. I would add the 41 to both sides. So we have x squared minus 6x plus 41 equals 0. So I would just use the quadratic formula. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. So I have x is 6 plus or minus square root of 36 uh, plus 164 over 2. I'm oh, sorry, minus 164, excuse me. Minus 164 over 2. Okay, so then we get 6 plus or minus square root of 164 minus 30 is 134, minus another 6 is minus 128, all over 2. So I get 6 plus or minus i square root of 128 over 2. That's what happens when you have a radical underneath your, your um, sorry, a negative underneath the radical. So now I have to break down square root of 128. Um, hopefully, if you use your perfect squares, you'll see that this is the square root of 64 and the square root of 2, which is 8 square root of 2. So I get x equals 6 plus or minus 8i square root of 2 over 2. Generally, we write the radical last so that we know what's underneath it. And then here I can divide all the coefficients by 2 or split this up into two fractions, like so. And I would get 3 plus or minus 4i radical 2. Notice I didn't cancel these 2s out. One of them is in a radical, one of them is out. Um, and that's that. All right, number five. So the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. Using just the discriminant, what can you tell about the roots? Well, let's just recall the discriminant is the quantity underneath the radical. So it's the b squared minus 4ac that's underneath the radical. And this will tell you something about the roots. So if I calculate the discriminant, so b squared minus 4ac in this case would be negative 5 squared minus 4 times 1 times 7 which is 25 minus 28, which is negative 3. If I had a negative 3 underneath the radical, so I'll take this b squared minus 4ac, if I have a negative 3 under there, I know the roots are imaginary. They're not real. So my roots, I'll have two imaginary roots because the quantity underneath the radical is a negative value. Okay. So let's do the same thing for number for letter B here. I have my quadratic I have my quadratic formula, which I will clone here. Clone. Okay, here we are. And I'm looking for the number underneath the radical to tell me something about the roots. So I have my B squared minus 4AC, my negative 7 squared minus 4 times 6 times 2. That's 49 minus 48, which is 1. If that number underneath the radical was a 1, your roots would not be ugly roots because the square root of 1 is 1, because 1 is a perfect square. So I would have real, I wouldn't have imaginary roots. I would have rational roots because I'm not going to get an ugly perfect, I'm not going to get an ugly square root, I'll get a nice square root. And I would have, <clears throat> excuse me, unequal roots because I would be doing plus or minus 1, and that would give me two distinct roots. So there we are. All right, same thing 
Here's my quadratic formula. I'm looking for the quantity underneath the radical. So I have b squared minus 4ac. So I have negative 20 squared minus 4 times 4 times 25. I get 400 minus 400, which is 0. So now if I have 0 underneath the radical, I'm going to take negative b and add or, add or subtract 0. So if I add or subtract 0, I'm not going to get two roots. I'm going to get one root. So I'll have a real. I'll have one root. I'll have one real rational root. Some people say the roots are equal. You think, oh, a quadratic always has two roots, but these two roots are actually the same root. Okay. In other words, this will factor into a perfect square trinomial. So you'll have two factors, but they'll both be identical. Okay, and last but not least, D. So here's my quadratic formula again. I'm looking for the quantity underneath the radical. I'm looking for B squared minus 4AC. So I have negative 6 squared minus 4 times A times C. So I get 36 minus uh, 56. So I get negative 20. So if I have negative 20 underneath the radical, I also get two imaginary roots. And that's that. Okay. Moving on. Number six, it says, what are the sum and the product of the roots of this equation? Now, you could go get the roots, but we learned a shortcut. And I just want to explain the shortcut. So let's say I had x equals 5 and x equals 2 as roots. Well, then my quadratic was x minus 5 times x minus 2 equals 0. That's a quadratic that produces those roots. If I multiply this out, I get x squared minus 2x minus 5x plus 10 equals 0. So I get x squared minus 7x plus 10 equals 0. Well, let's see where the 10 came from. The 10 came from the product of negative 5 and negative 2 which is identical to the product of positive 5 and positive 2. So this number is just the product of the roots. Now, when we took the roots, we had to negate them to make the factors. So this sum, this negative 7, is the opposite of the sum of the roots. So this is the opposite of the sum of the roots. If I look, 5 plus 2 is 7, but I have a negative 7 here. So if I'm going to use that pattern, I'm going to get the sum of the roots the sum of the roots here, it's going to be the opposite of negative 4, which is positive 4. And the product of the roots, because when, both, when we multiply a negative times a negative, it returns it to the original sign, the product of the roots is just negative 13. That does not change. So my sum of the roots is 4, and product is 13. All right, in number 7, we can actually use that, got that, we can actually exploit that property to actually create a quadratic equation that has these roots. So what I can do is get the sum of the roots, which is very easy because these are conjugate pairs. So when I add up negative 2 plus i radical 6 and negative 2 minus i radical 6, I get negative 4. So that's the sum of the roots. The product of the roots is a little bit more tricky, but it's not too bad. So I have negative 2 plus i radical 6 times negative 2 minus i radical 6. And if I distribute this out, negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Negative 2 times negative i radical 6 is positive 2i radical 6. Ne uh, i radical 6 times negative 2 is negative 2i radical 6. And positive i radical 6 times negative i radical 6 is negative i squared times 6. So the middle terms cancel, which is the property when you multiply conjugates together. So I have 4. i squared is negative 1, so I have 4 minus negative 1 times 6. So I have 4 plus 6, essentially, which is 10. So this is my product of the roots. And so now I have the sum of the roots and the product of the roots. So here's my equation. x squared, I have to negate the sum of the roots when I put it next to x. And I keep the product of the roots. And I make sure I write an equation setting this equal to zero. And that's my answer. Okay. Number eight. Oh, by the way, on number seven, you could go and check this if you wanted to with the quadratic formula. 
you could actually see, if I gave you a question like this on your final, you could actually get the roots of this and check and make sure that they're actually the same as I gave you. All right, so 8 and 9, I want you to solve the equation for all possible values of x. So I have radical 2x plus 1 minus x equals negative 7. We want to get the radical by itself, so I'll add x to both sides. So I have the square root of 2x plus 1 equals x minus 7. Square both sides, so I get 2x plus 1 equals x minus 7 squared, which I'm going to have to do out, so I'm going to write x minus 7 twice here. I can't just take the square root on both sides. That just kind of returns me to where I was. So I have 2x plus 1 equals x squared minus 7x minus 7x plus 49. So we have 2x plus 1 equals x squared minus 14x plus 49. Move the 2x and the 1 over. And I get... We get 0 equals x squared minus 16x plus 48. And this, thankfully, is factorable. Otherwise, this problem really would take a long time. This factors into x minus 12 times x minus 4. So that means x could be 12 or x could be 4. But remember, we always have to check radical equations because we can get um, undefined answers underneath the radical. So I'm going to check my x equals 12. I'm checking in the original equation. So I have square root of 2x plus 1 minus x equals negative 7. I'm going to check 12. So I have square root of 2 times 12 plus 1 minus 12 equals negative 7. So this becomes the square root of 25 minus 12 is negative 7. And I get 5 minus 12 is negative 7. That checks. So I'll keep that one around. Now I want to also check x equals 4. So I get square root of 2 times 4 plus 1 minus 4, does that equal negative 7? So let's find out. So I have um, 2 times 4 is 8 plus 1 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. And I get 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. That does not check. I hope it's clear as to what happens here. The square root of 9 is positive 3, not negative 3. So negative 3 minus 4 would give us negative 7, but since the square root is always going to pop out a positive answer, I get an extraneous root. So the only solution, let's understand this, the only solution is x equals 12. And you have to be careful to check these. Okay, number 9. We have 2x to the negative 4 thirds plus 3 is 165. Again, I'd like to get x by itself, so subtract 3. So we get 2x to the negative 4 thirds equals 162. Divide by 2. I get x to the negative 4 thirds equals 81. And then we can raise both sides to the negative 3 fourths power. And here's where we need to be careful. Ultimately, I'm taking x is equal to, I'm taking the fourth root of 81 and I'm cubing it. We're raising it to the negative third. Here's the problem. When I do the fourth root of 81, the fourth root of 81 is properly 3. But if I was solving this equation, y to the fourth equals 81, I could say y could be plus or minus 3. Because when I, when I raise a negative number to the fourth power, I do get a positive. So when I do this, I really need to say this. I really need to say plus or minus this. And this happens with even roots. When you're solving equations with even roots, 2, 4, 6, 8, you have to include both possibilities. And that's what's tricky about this question. So now I get x is plus or minus uh, 3 raised to the negative third. So if I had positive 3 to the negative third, that would be 1 over 3 cubed, which is 1 over 27. And if I had negative 3 to the negative third, that would be 1 over negative 3 to the positive third, which is negative 1 over 27. So you get two solutions here, 1 over 27 and negative 1 over 27. This is the one that people forget. That's the one that people forget because they mess up the even root possibility. Okay, number 10, we want to simplify the fifth root of 96x to the 11th y to the 24th. So fifth root, I want to look for groups of five. So I'm going to take 96 and I'm going to factor it. And I don't care what it factors into at first. I'm just going to keep factoring until I can't stop. I can't, can't factor anymore. So 2 is a prime factor. 
48 factors into 24 and 2, 24 is 6 and 4, 6 is 3 and 2, 4 is 2 and 2. So I get 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. So I have the fifth root of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. Okay? And 5 twos makes a perfect fifth. So that can come out because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 2 is 32. And that can come out as a 2. So I have 2 fifth root of 3 from that part. Now x to the 11th is x to the 11th is, I want a fifth root of, that's x to the fifth times x to the fifth times x squared. So this is x to the tenth. Fifth root of x to the tenth is x squared. So that can come out as well. And the other x squared has to stay inside. This stays in. It's not going to be paired up. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm writing x squared. That's x. That's just x to the first. I can't add. So 1x stays inside. And y to the 24th. So I want to group this in 5s. So 5, 10, 15, 20. So that's 5, fifth root of y to the 20th. Because that'll, the 20 divides in, uh, 5 divides into 20. So, and then we have y to the 4th left over. So the fifth root of y to the 20 is y to the 4th. And then the y to the fourth, can the other y to the fourth stays in, and you're good to go. By the way, if you don't get enough x's and y's out, you'll see that in here. You'll have powers that are bigger than 5, and you can continue to get them out. All right, two more here. So we have f of x is 3x to the negative 2 thirds minus 7x to the negative 1 sixth. We want to find f of 1 over 64. So f of 1 over 64 is 3 times 1 over 64 to the negative 2 thirds minus 7 times 1 over 64 to the negative 1 sixth. And so now you have to know how to operate with these exponents. So a couple of things. So I have 3 times. If I am raising something to a negative power, that means I'm raising its reciprocal to the positive power. So I can do that here pretty quickly. And so now I have 3 times 64 to, the, to, to 2 thirds. That is 3 times the cube root of 64 squared. It's easier to do the cube root first because you get a smaller number. Squaring 64 can be a pain. So I have 7 now, 7 times the 6th root of 64. Um, and now we just have to do the arithmetic. So 4th root of, uh, sorry, 3rd root of 64 is 4. 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. And I square that. 4 squared is 16 times 3 is 48. And the 6th root of 64 is 2. And I'll show you, if you're not sure of those in your head, I'll show you how to get them. 7 times 2 is 14, so the final answer is 34. In case you're not sure, if I factored 64, I would get, say, 32 and 2, 16 and 2, 8 and 2, 4 and 2, 2 and 2. So I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 twos. So if I want the third root of 64, that's the third root of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Group these together, I get two twos, so that becomes 4. And for the 6th root of 64, I hope you all see that that's just, there are there is one group of 6 twos in here. So I get 2 to come out. All right, one more. And it's a doozy, if I remember correctly, it is. So simplify that expression. Um, write the answer with no negative or fractional exponents. So I have negative 4x to the negative second times negative 2x to the negative third over the fifth root of x to the negative second times 2x to the negative 8 fifths. Lots of places to go here. Here's how I would approach it. First things first, I would try to um, look at some things that I can move around. So I have negative 4. Now notice, on negative 4x to the negative second, the exponent on the negative 4 is a positive 1 exponent. It's staying in the top. It's not moving to the bottom. The x to the negative second, however, can move to the bottom. Because, by the way, I have all multiplication here. Everything is a factor. So I can just move things top and bottom, no problem. Then I have in parentheses, in parentheses, negative 2x to the negative third. That can all go to the bottom as a positive exponent. Notice, the negative 2 is in the umbrella of that exponent. 
Whereas in the first case, the one was not in the umbrella, uh, sorry, the negative four was not in the umbrella of this exponent. It had its own exponent. All right, so we took care of the top. The bottom, now the bottom's interesting. I have to almost look and just be careful. I have fifth root of x to the negative second and x to the negative eight fifths. I think it would be best to write them in the same language, meaning either write them both as roots or both as powers. I'm actually going to write them both as roots. So we have the fifth root of x to the negative second times 2 times the fifth root of x to the negative eighth. And by the way, there are multiple ways to do this problem, but this is one of them. So now I have the fifth root of something times the fifth root of something else. That can become the fifth root of the multiplication of those guys, which is x to the negative tenth. And I still have all my other stuff, so I have negative 4 x to the second times two, negative 2 x to the third times the other 2. And now the fifth root of x to the negative tenth is x to the negative second. I can divide my root by my exponent. So this is now x to the negative second. So I have negative 4 over x squared times negative 2 x to the third times 2 times x to the negative second. And there's lots of places you can go with this. x squared times x to the negative second actually cancels. So I get negative 4 over negative 2x cubed times 2. And I can expand that out. I get negative 4 over negative 2x to the, to the third power is negative 8x to the third times 2. And now I can just expand this. So I have negative 4 over 16x to the third, which is negative 1 over 4x to the third. And that's it. So basically, I like that problem because it's got pretty much every property of exponents you would need to know in that one problem. Okay, that's it.